David Abrams, so good to see you. Ah, uh, it's wonderful to be here. It's just We've wonderful. had a long friendship, long life journey. Yes, and ma'am. every time I see you, it gets deeper and more delightful. And we've been kind of dancing around this term, living earth, in mm. these last few days with a wonderful group of people. And you've been dancing that notion for a very very long time mm. so what's bubbling up in you for that this term living earth oh so many things um the living earth the earth alive animate earth as i often feel it um gaia as 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 many folks speak of this mystery um for me um my term increasingly is not earth but earth uh spelling earth um a little differently putting an i in the middle of the word earth so e a i r t h in order to say that the i the self it seems to me the i is like that upright slash the letter i is like a pictograph of the upright spine of the human of this animal who then stood up on its hind legs and and that upright spine the eye is in the earth we don't live on the earth we live in the earth but only so when we recognize that the air this invisible medium born of our interbreathing with one another with all the other animals and what all us animals are breathing out all the plants are breathing in and what the plants are breathing out all us critters animals are breathing in talk about reciprocity the air born of the interbreathing of all of us animals plants with the soils with the oceans percolating this elixir that is really the uh, signature of a living planet that the air is not just a bunch of gases held to earth's surface by gravity but is is this is born of earth and it stretches up many miles overhead far beyond those clouds and we live down here immersed in this fluid medium as thoroughly as fish are immersed in the sea <laughs> so earth in order to say i live in the air and the air is entire a i r i is in air and the air a i r is entirely a part of the earth e a i r t h uh and it sounds earth vaguely scottish which is a plus too um um I love it um but so the living earth to me is also um is also something i feel into with my animal body um you know there was a sort of turn toward the body or toward embodiment or the bodily turn within uh the humanities within philosophy within um literature uh oh a couple decades ago and it lasted for a good long stretch but it was strange because very few of those who made the turn towards recognizing the centrality of the body in all our experience missed that you don't get the body without getting the whole of the body's world most of which ain't human um and especially the immense body that our bodies are endlessly in relation to it's as though this two-armed two-legged form is our small smaller body and the earth is our larger flesh um it's my larger body but it's also your larger body and the spider's larger body and the humpback that we all share a common flesh this immense spherical metabolism um in which our individual physiologies are all participant and embedded and so that's this, the living earth for me has that uh richly palpable fleshly quality and one other facet if i may that 
of course, it's terribly obvious, but we never experience the earth or the living earth in its entirety all at once. We all, we get glimpses of our particular corner of it. And where I live is the high desert of northern New Mexico, um, which is, I live at about a mile and a half in altitude, uh, red earth polka dotted with juniper and pinon pine, and just above us, the ponderosa forests, up the mountains, the Sangre de Cristo mountains. Um, but the quality of mind there, or the quality of the air there, the quality of the the psyche of that land is so different from the psyche of the land here mm -hmm. um, in in the eastern seaboard um, uh, a bit south of New England um, very very different from that in in the the Hudson River estuary um, or the northwest coast uh, where the, the the whole psyche of the place is infused by the salt spray and the needled trees and those cedars and the, their zinging scents. So that each place, each bioregion, would seem to be a unique organ of this living earth, of this of this spherical metabolism. And just as I need um we need our own place to flourish there in where I live, the upper Rio Grande Valley, the high desert. In order for that organ to flourish, I need the Hudson River estuary. I need the Amazon rainforest to be really doing its thing. If a cell in my left lung was trying to act like a cell in my kneecap, my body would fall apart. My metabolism would break down. And so what this suggests to me is that the quality of culture invited by that estuary at the mouth of the Hudson River um, is very different from the kind of quality of culture invited by the Amazon uh, rainforest, themselves both very different from, from the qualities of culture invoked by any other bioregion or organ of the planet. But so for the first time, it would seem we could say that in order for my culture to flourish with our spirits, with the gods that inhabit this land, raven, coyote, um, and the storm clouds that come circling through the high desert where I live, we need, we need your culture to be flourishing and your gods better be different from ours. And I hope you're dancing up those spirits in your place in that very other bioregion and that in the Amazon, a whole other set of powers are being honored and feasted and, and lending their blessing to life in that place so that a re-diversification of culture into the unique uh, style of particular places. That's also what living living Earth means to me. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Um, because another way of saying it is aligning ourselves to these great processes. Yes, indeed. Beautiful. So that the cultures reflect them, but also the processes of farming or how we're living with in relationship to. Yeah. So our search for energy forms and so on. It's trying mm. to be in resonance with water energy, yes. with sun energy, with earth energy, Beautiful. and so on. So what would it be if we were to sort of begin to take all our technological savvy we've developed over these last couple centuries um, and begin to um, finesse it? To, to, to let our sense that bigger is better begin to drop away and accept the invitation of gravity and, and let our technological savvy begin to unfurl into what are the forms of energy, energy generation that are most appropriate to this valley, which is different 
from the kind of windmills they'll have just over the mountain ridge. Maybe we've got windmills here, but they look weirdly different, don't they? Because the quality of the breeze here is different. Or the styles of water, uh, water power, hydropower here um, are interestingly different, adapting our technologies to the needs or aligning them, as you say, with the needs of particular places. It's almost as though our ever so many human injustices that um, are seem to be only um, increasing um, our interhuman strife and uh, tremendous injustices and violences um, could begin to ease if we stop just focusing on one another and turned ourselves both toward what does the ground ask of us? What does the land in this place ask of our different communities and our different ethnic groupings? Because in so many parts of the earth and in so many cities, even the different ethnicities, the different traditions are clashing. And in, in many ways, they have very little in common. But what they all have in common most is the place where they are. And so if we'd ask, what does the place ask of us? Then each of our traditions can pool its particular gifts into that mix of a culture of place. I love that. And, you know, maybe just to conclude, mm. beautifully said, um, there was a project done in L.A., for example, from mm. the streets to the stars. Mm. And these African-Americans who had, their families had migrated from the South, um, and they did their family histories. These were middle mm. school kids, mm. and they were feeling and understanding their place. By the end of the summer, this whole project, the, all the neighborhoods came to see what mm. the kids were doing, but they related it right out from that local place to earth systems to the stars itself. Mm. It can be done, right, David? Mm. It can be done. Oh, how, how, how beautiful. Um, Oh, please ask me one more question, just something. <laughs> so, you know, you've got the most extraordinary imagination that connects place to particular locations. And so you help people to see, like your image of salmon being mm -hmm. drawn up, mm -hmm. breathing in and breathing out with the ocean, the yes. rhythms and so on. So imagination, metaphor, mm -hmm. meaning making. Mm -hmm. um, how does this relate to humans are meaning craving mm -hmm. creatures and we're also symbolically inspired creatures mm -hmm. and so in finding our way forward it occurs to many people mm -hmm. that we need a new sense of this weaving that you're doing so beautifully the metaphoring and mm -hmm. imagining but also symbols that lift communities into yes vivacious ways forward. I think that that is in some ways the biggest part of our work, um, or it's a crucial part that is often left out of account. Um, um, I, I, I think of it as finding ways to speak otherwise. Um, as you know, my I, I, I just I my sense is that that language or the ways we we put words together um, can function to really shut down our animal senses and frustrate that instinctive rapport between our animal body and and the animate earth around us. But there are other ways of speaking that can open our senses and enhance and encourage that, that spontaneous reciprocity between our body, our sensate, creaturely um, um, organism, and the organic terrain around us, the sensuous terrain. And so to find the ways of, of, of eloquence, which for each of us will be different, and yet there'll be some phrases that you'll stumble upon that are so infectious that I'll pick it up right away. Um, 
and the best ones, the best kinds of word magics are uh, terms that are not so highfalutin and abstract, but that any child could understand. And so when the time is ripe, um, this, this term or this phrase could begin to spread like a kind of bloody contagion across uh, the world because it brings a, such a gestalt shift that it's just, it's ripe and ready. And I'm always looking for such, um, for such uh, phrases or ways. Um, and with that in mind, I'll just say one last thought. Um, feel free to take it out of this. Uh, but um, as it came up in the heat of passion yesterday, I am, am feel very saddened by this term, the Anthropocene, uh, as the word for, for the epoch in which we now are embarked. Uh, I have no dispute with what it names, that the human is a geological force, has been evident since I uh, became aware as a, as a little person. Um, surely we are a geological force. But to name this era the Anthropocene um, forecloses any turn toward humility. Uh, and it forecloses it for centuries, for thousands of years, to say this is the Anthropocene, is to say there is no more than human world because the human is now coterminous with the world itself. Um, anthropos. So my, my, my goofy but uh, quite serious thought here is since so many of my scientific sisters and brothers say, but David, we do need to emphasize that the human is a primary agency in this new epic. And that's what's, 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 what's new and strange about this. Um, and that's why they say anthropos. But I think, well, then let's work with the word for our species, human, which is cognate with the word humility, both from humus, from the soil, and call this new epoch something like the humilicene, the humilicene, that is the age of humility. Because it seems to me we ought to be humiliated by what we've wrought and begin to drink a deep glass of humility at this time as a species and begin praising everything else, not celebrating our own ascendance. So it seems to me. Here's to water that will make us humble. Hmm.